Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name's David Malone. I'm an Undersecretary General of the United Nations, and I have the privilege of serving as the head of the UN University System with the Latin title of Rector, which always takes uh, aback Anglo-Saxons. Uh, today, we received a number of guests at UNU, all of them connected with the Hideo uh, Noguchi Prize in medicine. It's in fact a dual prize, as we'll establish in the short conversation that follows. The two honorees are Dr. Alex Goodwin Coutinho of Makarere University in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, Dr. Coutinho uh, won uh, as the founder and organizer of the AIDS support organization TASO, which has done an extraordinary job of reaching out to those infected with the HIV uh, virus. Uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Piot uh, won for his role in medical research. So you see the contrast between service and medical health systems and the research end of medicine, which is tremendously important. Uh, Dr. Piot has a long past in uh, the tropical medicine field. Today, he is director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. You may remember him as the very kinetic, very dynamic and effective head of UN AIDS for many years the UN umbrella organization, creating strategies, raising money, driving down costs of treatment, all of this for the treatment of AIDS in the developing world. An extraordinary success under uh, the UN's banner. Um, he had earlier experience in Africa. Notably, he was part of the team that identified the Ebola virus in Central Africa in 1976, and he had much other involvement at the research end of medicine in Africa at the time. Uh, our Japanese hosts are tremendously proud of Hideo Noguchi. We'll hear a little bit about him. Uh, and our guests are going to tell us what they think is very important today about the fight against AIDS, which isn't over in spite of the very significant successes that have been registered. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, one of you, I don't know, either Peter or Alex, to describe who Hideo Noguchi was. It's such an interesting story uh, and the connection to Japan through him. Peter? Yeah. Let me start, and because we, uh, Alex and I visited just the uh, place where Dr. Noguchi was, uh, was born um, in Fukushima uh, district, uh, prefecture. And uh, a few points. Um, Hideo Noguchi comes from a very poor background. We saw the house where he was born. His, he was uh, educated by his mother who worked very hard. They lived in poverty. But he worked extremely hard. He was a very intelligent uh, boy also. And um, he is one of the truly um, global scientists, the early ones that uh, Japan produced because he, was, he studied medicine, then microbiology, and uh, was the first one in Japan to diagnose the plague, which uh, coming on a ship in the harbor of Yokohama, where he was working in the quarantine station, and then uh, studied epidemics in uh, China, moved to the Rockefeller, um, sorry, moved to the United States, uh, first in uh, Philadelphia, and uh, for further training, was one of the founding scientists of what is now Rockefeller University. He's worked in Brazil, Ecuador, and then finally died in, um, in Ghana while studying yellow fever. Um, and he was the first one to um, identify um, treponema, syphilis in the brain. And he has many discoveries in microbiology uh, on his name. And, but I think he's a truly global scientist. He is uh, um, a top scientist, but also was always concerned that his science would benefit the poor in the world. And I think that I saw can be also explained by uh, his own uh, modest origins and, and how he got out of that. Great. And, uh, Alex? I mean, uh, my take on Dr. Hideo was that 
in a sense, he bridged medical research and medical services. Yes. He mm. was both a proficient and well-loved doctor, uh, and he was clearly an accomplished uh, researcher, as well as a linguist uh, mm. who was able to operate in, in many environments. Um, and he was particularly concerned to make sure that his research was applicable and went beyond the laboratory and benefited and saved the lives uh, of many people. And tragically, of course, uh, he died uh, in Africa before he had uh, completely achieved probably what would have been an even more illustrious life. Uh, but clearly his accomplishments uh, were way beyond his time. His thinking was way beyond his time in terms of the globalization of disease. And uh, we are privileged mm. uh, to be able to continue in that spirit. Mm. Alex, our viewers will have seen uh, at the beginning of the program that uh, you work at the University of Makareri, but you work countrywide in effect. I wanted to ask you of the three uh, of the points you made in a very rich lecture here at UNU, what would be the three that you think are stand out in your mind as the most important relating to your work in the field? Well, clearly I've been working in Africa. I was born in Africa, worked in Africa for the first 30 years as a doctor. And using HIV as a case study, I was trying to show that uh, it is very important that we develop the science to be able to understand the disease, understand what it takes to prevent it and what it takes to combat it and treat it and eradicate it, hopefully. And so I was showing the linkage between the cutting-edge science that has been produced around, say, HIV testing, mm. around uh, developing the drugs that treat HIV, and what it has taken from a scientific point of view to translate them into uh, products or technologies that are appropriate to the villages of Africa, where the majority of Africans live. And that technological breakthroughs have helped to deliver services to millions of people in Africa and beyond. But that this alone is not sufficient, that you also need health systems, you need financing, you need human resources. All of these things come together. Each of these pieces is interdependent on the other. But my focus was clearly that without the science, we wouldn't even have anything to use uh, in these particular villages. Terrific. And Peter, what, what points would you particularly want to register from your intervention? Well, first of all, we've made enormous progress in terms of health all over the world, mm. uh, including in Africa and, and including against HIV. Um, but there's a new agenda looming with new diseases um, like diabetes and obesity and so on coming up. And we have to prepare and to work on them while we are still trying to uh, make sure that our unfinished agenda of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, that we, we finish that agenda. Um, secondly, is that and science has made enormous contributions to our health and well-being, um, not only in high-income countries, but also uh, in Africa. For example, science has given us antiretroviral therapy, otherwise anti-HIV drugs, which is now saving millions of lives. I mean, there are now about eight million people on antiretroviral therapy in low- and middle-income countries. Those 8 million people would be dead by now uh, without that product of science. And there are other um, uh, dev scientific developments that have, of course, benefited people, vaccines and so on. And thirdly, the power of partnership. It's not enough to have the, the science, it's not enough to have the statistics, but we need to work together to have results. Mm. Um, and that um, should become also more of equal type of partnerships. I think the time is gone that we have those uh, you know, who give money and di dictate uh, what the agenda should be. Uh, one, it doesn't work mm. because if people don't feel that, uh, that that's that they own the agenda and that it will work, it won't work. But also I think now today we have centers of excellence also in Africa. For example, Makareri University. We have them in many, many countries. And that for me makes me also uh, optimistic that we will see a continuing uh, progress in health and well-being and development, including in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Well, you're at the coalface, Alex, in uh, Uganda, and indeed you uh, 
daily are out with the stakeholders, really, of the strategy. Peter, you, uh, when you were running UNAIDS, but also as a scientist both before and after your years at uh, UNAIDS, have contributed particularly from the uh, research angle. The fight against AIDS has been very successful so far, but there's a risk of slacking off now, it seems to me, not by interested communities, but by the wider public. In conclusion, might I ask you whether you have any thoughts on how that can be avoided at this point? Well, clearly there have been many successes, but we must remember we don't have a vaccine yes, yet. And the, a major contributor to the end game has got to be an HIV vaccine. And so uh, if I were to focus on that particularly, we need to still put resources, we need intellectual resources and research and, and so on and to make this happen. Um, but uh, with regard to the other challenges of people feeling that, you know, we've made tremendous progress and uh, we don't have, and yet that progress may not be sustained because we don't have sufficient resources, we need to rethink what has brought the success so far and understand that new partnerships will be needed, but particularly Africa itself needs to invest its own resources. This has been a decade of increasing prosperity for Africa. Mm. Many African governments, many countries, including my own, are discovering oil and mineral mm. wealth. And we need to see a lot of that plowed back into not just HIV, but other health issues and other development issues mm. that will ensure that the African population is lifted out of poverty, but started on a pathway of sustainable development. Terrific, Alex. Last word to Peter on this. How do we not lose track of the threat? Well, first of all, AIDS is not over, mm. recognizing that uh, and not saying this kind of nonsense, um, and, uh, but re recognizing our achievements. We need a long-term view here, and that long-term view will um, mean that we have to make sure that uh, the response to it remains embedded in the communities while progress advances. I don't believe that we can stop this epidemic without a vaccine. I couldn't agree more with uh, with Alex, but we can go a very long way and um, it will need um, continuing leadership and coming from within the communities. Uh, leadership is not only for the head of state, but it's at many different levels, but also a continuing international solidarity. Many African countries will not be able to afford um, a treatment and to, um, for HIV, but also for other health problems without uh, international assistance, even if they can do more with increasing wealth. But that kind of international solidarity, to use a very old fashioned word, but will remain necessary. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think why TICAT was important. Mm. Great, thank you both very much for joining us today.